Good morning. Uh, please could I ask you to be upstanding at the beginning of our worship today uh, for the arrival of our Lord Lieutenant of East Sussex, Mr Andrew Blackman. Would you please be seated? I did say it was going to be a warm welcome, and, and a warm welcome you have in spades. Can I urge you, if you are here and feeling the temperature already, do feel free to loosen your jacket or remove it. If you're wearing a tie, you can take it off. And if you see Leslie and I start to disrobe, do not be alarmed. <laughs> Um, it is a joy for this service of celebration to welcome a number of people who represent our town, our county, our king, here to this place. So as well as our welcome to Mr Andrew Blackman, our Lord Lieutenant, I'm very delighted that Madam Mayor uh, Candy Vaughan is with us today. Our MP, Ms Caroline Ansell, who represents our town at Westminster, and Mr Stephen Lloyd, her predecessor, who was involved at the beginning of this scheme, is also present. If you are here because you are a past or previous mayor, if you represent the town in any capacity at all, if you are a head teacher uh, newly appointed to a local Methodist Anglican school, or if you are here because you have walked in off the street and have just discovered a place to sit, you are welcome uh, in any of those capacities. Uh, this service is also being streamed, uh, just to be aware, and is on Zoom as well. So those of you who are streaming, you are also welcome just to point out a few housekeeping things, we will try and keep this space as cool as we can. There are fans that are turning in ventilation turrets above, and we have some windows open. We have water down each side of the church, so do get up from your seats if you need some. And if you get very warm and you need to take a break, then go into the hall. The doors are open, and... There is a TV screen in there which is streaming the service as well, so you won't need to miss a thing. So do make sure that you are comfortable um, in the service today. We're going to begin our service in praise and thanksgiving, so please be upstanding as you are able to for our opening hymn, which will be on the screens behind. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven.
one person who I didn't welcome because he was not in my eye line is my friend Leslie Griffiths, the Lord Griffiths of Berryport and past president of the Methods Conference. I was only looking at people in front of me, Leslie, so apologies for not including you in the initial welcome. Uh, without you, this service would not be taking place. So thank you uh, and welcome to you and to Margaret too. For those of you who have uh, not been to Emmanuel before, I'm going to tell you who we are through the medium of tapestry. We were two Methodist and two United Reformed churches in Eastbourne, Central and St Andrews and Greenfield and Upperton. And somebody had the idea many years ago that actually isn't it better to come together? Isn't it more beautiful when people work in harmony and in unity together with all of their differences and boy oh boy are we different from one another as four churches but we have come together and as the four churches have merged we have merged into one people so since 2018 Emmanuel Church has existed so although this might be your first time here we, we've been around for five years already this place is rather newer as you can see Bet you're all thinking, hasn't he been busy in the last few weeks? <clears throat> so as well as the four churches coming together, this tapestry illustrates, I suppose you could say, our next phase. Because now we're in this place, sorry choir, now we're in this place, all shiny new and nearly new and some of it not quite finished. But this tapestry illustrates... Emmanuel within Eastbourne. So we have images of bandstand and lifeboat, of towner, of pier, tennis, uh, the coat of arms, the Devonshire Park. And this represents that actually we are hoping to be a church that is a part of our town and that belongs to our town and welcomes all from our town. So that is our fervent hope as a church. So if, uh, if one tapestry shows you who we were, that tapestry shows you who we hope to be. I'll leave them there and do feel free to have a look at them after the service. Can we show our appreciation to Beryl who created both of those? Sorry, Beryl. <laughs> A prayer of praise. Let us pray. In you, gracious God, the widowed find a carer, the orphaned find a parent, and the fearful find a friend. In you, loving God, the wounded find a healer, the penitent find a pardoner, the burdened find a counsellor. In you, wonderful God, the miserly find a beggar, the despondent find a laughter maker, and the legalists find a rule breaker. In you, Jesus Christ, we meet our maker and our match. Loving God, as we come before you to offer you our prayers, our praises, our hymns and our hopes, we pray that you would bless us in this act of worship, that we may truly be your children here in this place. Amen. I'll bet you all gave some consideration as to what to wear this morning. If you get invited anywhere, 
whether it's to a service, if you get invited to a party, if you get invited to an event, an occasion, anything like that, at some point you will have to think about what to wear. We all do it. I try and wear what is fitting for the occasion. So, I am quite smart today. If I'm at Messy Church with bacon sandwiches and ketchup flying around, white is not really an option. You will find me in jeans and a rather more casual clerical shirt. If I visit somebody in hospital, a clerical shirt is a must. It's a passport. It gets me onto wards and sometimes lets me not use visiting times. And if I'm really lucky, lets me avoid paying for the car park as well. <laughs> what to wear? What to put on for an event? If you're not too sure what to wear, you might ring a friend and ask what they're wearing to something. And if you're a bit naughty, you'll then just wear something a little bit smarter than, than whatever they told you. Let me show you a few things that I've been wearing recently around here. <clears throat> oh, I've had these on far more times than I care to remember and for far longer than I ever expected to. This one is now completely moulded to the shape of my head and, and I've grown substantially to now fit this so it's no longer loose fitting on me. Both have been exceptionally useful in the years that this place, the church that was here and standing, was demolished and then with this one rising. A hard hat and a high-vis jacket. What do I do with these now? Give them back to Cheesemuir, could do. Could pop them in the vestry as a bit of a memento, keep them out, try them on from time to time to see if they still fit. Arguably, I'm not gonna need these again because frankly, the building's up, but I've been thinking recently, I'm not too sure. We need our hard hats sometimes, you and I. We really do. Some of us here in this place will get a hard time for the jobs we do, for the words we say, for the opinions that we hold, and for the justice that we speak. Hopefully, that's all of us. But if you say that actually the world should be a lot more loving than it, than it is, if you say that poverty shouldn't be an issue like it is, if you say that our policies and the lives that you and I choose to lead should be fairer and more compassionate that they are, sometimes you'll have a bashing and you'll need a hard hat to protect you. And those of you here who represent us in Eastbourne, either at local council level or in Westminster, you'll need a hard hat from various times. The hive is... Well, actually, when you and I tell the world that it should be a little bit more loving, that actually God's love is greater than human love, that God is the source of all of the love that you and I have, and God enables us to be welcoming, to include, to be forgiving, and to be generous, actually, don't we want to say that with a high-vis jacket on? Don't we want to proclaim that message? that actually that love of God is there for all of us and that we should declare it as loudly and as brightly and as garishly as we can. In the days to come, whether you have days that are a bit more hard hat or a bit more high vis, may the love of God be with you in all that you do, in all that you speak, in all of the places that you represent and share that love. We're going to sing again, so please um, be upstanding. This hymn speaks of the qualities of God. It speaks of the sun coming up and new days coming before us. And actually that is the time when our voices lift in praise and prayer again. It also speaks that actually when the day draws to a close, that actually still God's love is there. It's blessed the Lord, O oh my soul, 10,000 reasons.
Please be seated. We have two Bible readings in our service today, and in a moment, um, our Lord Lieutenant, Mr. Andrew Blackman, will share our gospel passage for us. Uh, but first of all, Madam Mayor Candy Vaughan will share a piece from Paul's letter to the Romans. Um, thank you, Candy. Our Bible reading comes from the Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 13 and beginning at verse 8, living in love. Be under no obligation to no one. The only obligation you have is to love one another. Whoever does this has obeyed the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not commit murder, do not steal, do not desire what belongs to someone else. All these and any others besides are summed up in the one command, Love your neighbour as you love yourself. If you love others, you will never do them wrong. To love, then, is to obey the whole law. You must do this because you know that the time has come for, to, for you to wake up from your sleep. For the moment when we will be saved is closer now than it was when we first believed. The night is nearly over, day is almost here. Let us stop doing the things that belong to the dark and let us take up weapons for fighting in the light. Let us conduct ourselves properly as people who live in the light of day. No orgies or drunkenness, no immorality or indecency, no fighting or jealousy, but take up the weapons of the Lord Jesus Christ. Stop paying attention to your sinful nature and satisfy satisfying its desires. Thanks be to God for his word to us. Our gospel reading comes from the Gospel of St Matthew, chapter 18, reading from verse 15. Unity in earth and heaven. If your brother sins against you, go to him and show him his fault. But do it privately, just between yourselves. If he listens to you, you have won your brother back. But if he will not listen to you, take one or two other persons with you, so that every accusation may be upheld by the testimony of two witnesses, as the scripture says. And if he will not listen to them, then tell the whole thing to the church. Finally, if he will not listen to the church, treat him as though he were a pagan or a tax collector. And so I tell all of you, what you prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven. What you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. And I tell you more, whenever two of you on earth agree about anything you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, I am there with them. Thanks be to God for his word to us.
rang. It was Paul. And he said, we have a special event on Sunday. What shall we wear? <laughs> and we thought, the mayor will be here in all her rigmarole. And the Lord Lieutenant will be here, this sparkling uniform, and perhaps his sword. <laughs> We'd better do justice to that. Let's wear our cassocks. Only when the phone was put down, clearly, Paul had the idea that he had a slightly better one, white for the occasion, than I, an old stager, still wearing black. If only I'd known, <laughs> both of you, it would have helped greatly. <laughs> but I'm not a man to fuss around. Now I've seen the example you set, I'm going to take all this off. <laughs> you can tell your children and your grandchildren that you saw a minister. Uh, the trouble with the cassock is that it does hide a multitude of sins. And I'm rather afraid now that I've got this far and have to go further. But uh, my trousers are for travelling in. And here I am, dressed for the season. <laughs> but I did show willing. I hope Madam Mayor and uh, Lord Lieutenant will report that back to your respective authorities. <laughs> it is a wonderful thing to be here, I have to say. And last night I was hoping that I could, where's this car? Last night I was hoping that I could conjure up the same sense of red, white and blue that they did in the Albert Hall on the last night of the proms and get you to give a rousing rendition of Britannia or Land of Hope and Glory or since for years I slept in a bedroom out of whose window I could see the grave of William Blake Jerusalem but you don't look up to it <laughs> and I don't blame you good to have representatives of civic society here and the institutions of state um, with our religious community bent upon offering ourselves for the widest possible service to the well-being of the citizens of this town and becoming a haven uh, from which all kinds of initiatives and outreach will take place to help those in distress and also a place where people can come and find peace and quiet in their times of need. For us all to be together to get this thing up and moving seems to me to be a very powerful statement in itself. It's also particularly pleasing to be with Paul, uh, Paul's son who um, has now grown so tall since last time I saw him that he could put Paul in his pocket. <laughs> there's Matthew back there and there's Paul here and Paul's dad, Barry, is there. And Barry and I are old mates. Barry wrote two of the finest books on the history of Methodism, illustrated, and if they're not still in print, they should be. The best thing that happened on my watch is back there. Um, and then, of course, when I was a student age 18, I heard the first local preacher outside my own circuit of Llanelli and Carmarthen in South Wales I was with friends in Barry. What's occurring? In Barry. And the preacher was Edwin Tabraham. Four generations of Tabrahams. And I'm delighted to be here on what is for me has such a, 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 a rich family feel about it. Of course, I mustn't forget their respective wives. Wives, Joan is there and Claire is here. 
um, because it's all part of the same. Oh, and of course, Claire's parents are here too, and lovely to see them. Well, I'd better not go on like that, or because you might think that's my sermon. I mean, I haven't even started yet, all right? Um, it's, a, it's a funny thing to know how to pitch a sermon for an occasion like this. I've never ever, when I go to do these things, decided that let's get the temperature of the place, let's flick through the Bible or open it at random and find something that's special for today. I have always, always gone to the lectionary and used the lessons that are chosen and being followed by churches everywhere along throughout Eastbourne today and indeed around the world. Because it seems to me that not only must we cultivate a sense of the specialness for us of this occasion, but we must set the specialness in the context of passages of scripture that God's people are dealing with everywhere you can think of. The curse of uh, specialness is only too obvious. If you think you're special, then you believe you have a mandate to do as you like. If you know that your specialness is part of a bigger whole, you know that you've been given your specialness to be more generally useful. Seems obvious to me, but I don't meet it very often in daily life. I didn't know where to start. I still haven't started, but I'm, a, but I'm about to. I've called my sermon on the pulse of the morning. One or two of you may know why I've done that. A great friend of mine was Maya Angelou. We were corresponding friends for years. She'd send me things she wrote. I'd send her things I wrote. Our paths crossed from time to time. She's one of the great black women poets of the modern age. And once I remember in the manse, oh, way back, putting the television on to see the second inaugural of Bill Clinton as President of the United States. And he calls to read a poem written for the occasion, Maya Angelou. Her poem, of course, about the, the free bird, and I rise, I rise, are her two most famous poems. But on the pulse of the morning is another. And I'm going to read a little bit of that now, whilst I've got a little bit of your attention before drowsiness seeps in. On the pulse of the morning, she envisages America from the perspective of parts of the created order that are older than humanity. A rock, a river, a tree. And asks us to look from that angle of view. And I'm not going to read it all, it's four pages. And you are behaving yourself. If you hadn't been, you'd have had all four pages. But from that vantage point, this is a bit of what she says. There is a true yearning to respond to the singing river and the wise rock and the old aged tree. So say the Asian, the Hispanic, the Jew, the African, the Native American, the Sioux, the Catholic, the Muslim, the French, the Greek, the Irish, the rabbi, the priest, the sheikh, the gay, the straight, the preacher, the privileged, the homeless, the teacher, they hear. They all hear the speaking of the tree. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. Lift up your eyes upon this day breaking for you. Give birth again to the dream. The horizon leans forward offering you the space to place new steps of change. Here, on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and shout, and into your sister's eyes, and into your brother's face, look, see your country and your community, and say simply, very simply, with hope. Good morning. As uh, we just heard, looking forward is as important as looking back. 
I have to say that having spent my entire life trying to understand and explain to others the doctrine of the Trinity, three in one and one in three, still working on it. The thought of you lot working on the doctrine of four in one and one in four, or for those who have never been in any of them, five in one or one in five, but the secret will be at the end of the day whether out of your differences of history, culture, background, you can weave a tapestry that is coherent and you can proclaim and live out a message that in its unity strikes people with all its appeal, its comeliness, its desirability. Well, we got um, the reading a moment ago a prototypical safeguarding. Uh, we've not always got our safeguarding policies right. And I believe it's time possibly for an impact assessment, as we say in circles I now move in. Um, but for all that, the importance is without any doubt at all. This must be safe space. If anybody has a worry, they must feel free to be able to express that worry. Uh, first of all, to a friend, and if there's the conviction that that hasn't been heard, uh, two or three more friends, and indeed the church, but there comes a point when there's no doubt about it at all, the only place for it to be ruled is outside the church. There's too much conflict, potential conflict of interest within the body itself. I'm quite sure all those elements have to be woven in, but they are in the passage of scripture that we just heard. And if Christians working out their differences their grievances, their problems, if with transparency and honesty and openness they bear their soul or they ask the awkward question or they deal with things as they find them and not as other people have told them, there is a hope that lower level solutions can be found to problems before they become the problems that simply must then be referred on to others. I know it's a balancing act, and I know these days, the climate we are living in, it's almost dangerous even to suggest that. But I'm just trying to work out what the scripture is trying to help us with here, that where two or three are gathered together, if it's in the spirit of Jesus, who after all was himself a victim. Jesus was a victim. We hear the victim's voice in the person who was persecuted, cruelly treated, and shoved on a cross. And therefore, when he speaks about human suffering, comes to us as someone who might be very helpful in our darkest days. This last week has been marked for me by the smile on a boy's face. Anybody guessed what I'm talking about? Ahmed Rahib in the Yemen. You've seen that on the news. This extraordinary boy, born blind in the competing rivalries between Iran and Saudi Arabia, and absolutely radiant with the cheekiest 11-year-old smile you ever saw, and a refusal to count out to all the pressures that his life has brought upon him. So it's with that hope that emanates from that smile that I look at the question of how relationships form, how they're maintained, how the best chances for their survival can be worked at, and then express to you lovely people how I wish that that is exactly how it will all work out here. A safe place. A safe place where we need have no fears. But there's openness and transparency and grown-up people dealing even with difficult things in sensible ways. Those of us who are married, and Margaret is here, I mean, I've never worked out how anybody could live with me for 54 years. I, I really don't, I think that's, a, that's kind of a miracle. Well, there she is, she's done it. Um, but, but we could recount the, well, and of course we ought to say congratulations to Claire and, uh, and, and, and Paul who just celebrated their silver wedding anniversary. There's uh, that's another 30 years for you two to go. <laughs> but there's simply no point in, in holding on to stuff that you know you're going to have to sort out one day or another because you get into a sulk 
or a bit of self-righteousness or anger or willful misapp misapprehension you've got to sort it out did any relationship work on any other basis well why not in the church why not the church be a family in that sense a safe place for people to air their inner selves find support for their daily problems and seek a way forward in a more wholesome and stronger way well that's what I sort of drew from the lectionary gospel reading I have to say that um, when we come to uh, the epistle it's slightly different because there we're told love is the fulfillment of the law now I'm a member of the British delegation to the Council of Europe I go four times a year for a week at a time to Strasbourg I sit on its migration committee I'm involved on a daily basis with problems relating to migration the observation of human rights the rule of law and democracy well, I have to say, looking back, I look at Carolyn and see if she agrees with me, um, in Parliament just at the moment, the three words I put down to describe just how we're all with each other, tetchy, tired, troubled. Not far from true, are they? And I'm not talking about my party and your party. I'm talking about within your party and within mine. I'm talking about in Parliament as a whole. The problem seems so huge. How on earth will we find the best wisdom or the resource? How will we deal with the things that happen, like falling ceilings and escapee prisoners, that this time last week we had no clue about? And, well, I don't know. We uh, have handed back to your lot, and you'll get it tomorrow, the online safety bill. Five years we've been looking at that. I've been involved with it from day one since Jeremy Wright introduced uh, a position paper. Online safety, absolutely wonderful. Parliament at its best, across the political divide. I heard the tributes being paid from the dispatch box only on Wednesday as we handed the third reading and the final bit of it in the House of Lords over to the House of Commons for the last little adjustments that the minister at our end promises he's going to try and get from his government at the other end. But there you've got it. You've got the safety of children. You've got freedom of speech. You've got encrypted privacy. Guaranteed. Well, just about guaranteed. Um, and you've got a responsibility placed squarely on the shoulders of the internet platforms to be responsible for what goes out over those platforms with heavy fines for offences. I was proud to be a member of our parliament this week. And I look forward to the finished bill when it becomes an act ready for His Majesty to sign later in the week. When our parliament can stand up and seem to be a national body working for the well-being of society at large. Now, I must be very careful at this point because the week before we passed another bill which was famous for eliciting more nasty talk and mutual accusation um, than um, I've heard for a very long time. And it was, of course, the Illegal Migration Bill, which is now an act of Parliament. And I don't stand here to abuse the privilege of standing in this pulpit to share my views with you on the matter, just to observe the mood of Parliament within which those discussions have taken place. Mutual uh, incrimination, accusation, allegation. And it's just been such an unpleasant place to be when that bill... And I have played my full part, not in making it unpleasant. No, 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 not a flaw. But because I am on the Migration Committee of the Council of Europe, to bring the concerted views of that continental body, 46 nations, to the debate. So the law and the rule of law 
as instanced in the reading we just heard, are very important. How can we live in a society that doesn't observe the rule of law? But law on a piece of paper, or even vellum and stacked in the archive, is simply a formulation of words unless the spirit of the generosity or imagination that brought it into being is also part of what we look at. You see, the, the European Convention on, on the Status of, of Refugees was, was actually formed in 1950 by British lawyers. And when they got the convention where they wanted it in words and they'd signed it, they added a codicil, did our British lawyers, saying, we know that this is now what we want to do. But we also recognize that some countries will have to pay a higher price to achieve this than other countries. So the countries that are not paying high price are urged to be generous in helping the other countries to achieve the objectives of the convention. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Do you remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, the law, but I say, and he does that six times. And the last time, he, and this is the Sermon on the Mount, I've heard people cavil at tiny bits of scripture that means this and therefore, and are blithely ignorant of the fact that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus distances himself from those who have a mechanistic understanding of applying the law. The law is to be applied in a spirit of love, generosity of spirit a way not to ignore the law. He said, I've come to fulfill the law. And he says, you've heard that it was said you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I say to you, you must love your enemy. What difference does it make if people only love the people who love them? Seems obvious to me. Well, why can't people give credibility to those large, large tenets of truth when they cling so firmly to minuscule bits from corners of the Bible that it's difficult to understand. So those are the two passages that we had. I've spoken about Maya Angelou, my friend. And I come to the end of what I want to share with you. I always tell people when I'm coming to the end because it does cheer them up. Um, <laughs> Um, of course, I can then abuse what I've just said. Um, I, I'm hoping, uh, it's, it's always nerve-wracking for me when the Lord Lieutenant's here, because he's got a direct route to places that could put me in the Tower of London. And um, <laughs> it, it, was, it was absolutely fantastic that he didn't bring his sword, actually, because um, I'd have felt really on edge then. Now, what I want to do is, my wife tells me that I suffer from, uh, well, delusion. She thinks that my going into the House of Lords has given me airs and graces and an understanding of myself that's, that's grossly inflated. But even she hears me now and again speaking as if I've begun to think that I'm part of the royal set. See, be careful, listen very carefully to what I'm saying here. And I, well, I have to admit it from time to time, I can, grand illusion is exactly what happens, but my recurring dream is this. I'm standing not uh, behind a bespoke piece of furniture in a church, but on a rickety platform uh, in a dock where a ship has just been built. And here's the ship, HMS Emmanuel. And I'm here to launch this ship. In my hand, I have the largest ever bottle of Methodist de-alcoholized champagne. <laughs> the only kind worth wasting. <laughs> and I swing it across the bows of the, of the vessel, which then moves elegantly backwards into a future it can't see. But once on the waters, facing the way it needs to go, we we'll know all about the storms of life and the things that might happen. And all I can say, and I hope it will be thought to be a fitting way to end, is HMS Emmanuel. 
God bless you. God bless this vessel and all who sail in her. Today and always. Amen. Thank you, Leslie, and th thank you for making me the best dressed person in the room. Um, we're going to sing a hymn now which celebrates the love of which Leslie spoke, the love that we hold in our hearts and share with our words and deeds. Please be upstanding as, as we sing Love Divine or Love's Excelling. Let us bring before God our prayers for ourselves, for those whom we love, for the world in all of its need. Let us pray. When I say the words, your kingdom come, will you please respond, your will be done. Loving God, your kingdom come, your will be done. 
May your will be done, Heavenly Father, for this world in which you have given us, for all creation and its needs of climate, for justice across the globe, for systems of economy and politics that serve all and not just a few, for places where there is war, civil war, no government. Loving God, may you be the source of all healing in fractured relationships that the leaders of the nations may rule and lead wisely for all. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And loving God, may your will be done here in this town and in this place. We pray for all who work and strive to make Eastbourne a place of compassion and welcome, fairness and prosperity. We pray for our mayor, our MP, for our council, for our county council and for those who work in churches and charities, businesses, all places. May we be people who live well with our differences. May we speak healing and peaceful words when they are needed. May we look after those who are most vulnerable in our midst. Your kingdom come, your will be done. We pray for ourselves. We pray for the people who we are and the people whom we would love to be. We pray knowing, Heavenly Father, your forgiveness for our shortcomings and your open arms when we are in need. We thank you that you never let us go and that you bless us with healing, with hope and with guidance and wisdom in abundance. May your kingdom come, your will be done. Loving God, for all of the prayers that we have said aloud, those that we say unspoken in our hearts and those we hold quietly at other times and in other places, may you guide and bless, may you cherish us, and may we know your love eternal for us. Your kingdom come, your will be done. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord. Amen. Amen. Shall we pray the traditional form of the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I'm going to ask Nick just to come forward and bring forward our offer tree that we have gathered here today. We have brought much here, you and I. Some give by standing order and direct debit, others by envelope and cash. We will give throughout the week to many different causes. The Disasters Emergency Committee, I gather, will be uh, creating an appeal for Morocco and other causes that we know locally. May all the giving that we do uh, be held in this prayer. Let us pray. Loving Lord, open our hearts to your love that we may be generous and loving to others. May every gift and every act of giving be a symbol and a sign of your almighty love for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. 
after our worship there will be tea and coffee and colder drinks I assure you available in the hall uh, do feel free to wander about the building if you've not been here before uh, there will be a, a, a small guided tour going around as well afterwards um, just to remind people that the nursery uh, were back in this building uh, last week so the nursery are up and running uh, our lettings have also begun Guild begins on Tuesday, I want to say, for those of you who come to Guild. Uh, so the activities in this building are cranking up um, as it is nearly finishing. Shall we end our worship with a hymn of praise and thanksgiving? Uh, I cannot tell why he whom angels worship.
So may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit remain with us and guide us this day and forevermore. Amen. Would you please remain standing just for a moment?